Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be ranking my personal top 10 favorite Richard Matheson short stories. Now let me just go ahead and tell you, I have not read all of Richard Matheson's short stories. There are well over a hundred and something, maybe even 200, I don't even know exactly. I only had 30 short stories of his in three collections. So I read all 30 of those in July and I'm going to give you my top 10 of those. So let's get started. You know that old saying that goes something like, you get back what you put out into the world. Well, this is exactly that story. 1952's Madhouse is about a middle-aged college professor named Chris who is completely miserable in his life. He hates his job, he hates his boss, he hates his wife, he is not happy in his marriage. He blames Sally for not following his own dreams of becoming a writer. Even though he still tries to write every now and then, it's just it, little things start irritating him over the years and he's not sure where his anger came from. It just kind of built and built over the years. And so every little thing irritates this man. And when he tries to sit down and write, if his pencil lead breaks, he breaks the whole thing and throws it in the garbage. Or if he's typing on the typewriter and the keys, the little strikers stick together, it infuriates him so much and so that anger has to go out into the world or more specifically into the house seemingly bad things happen to everyone in the world you know little things like you can be walking and the carpet runner slips and you might trip a little bit or you cut yourself shaving or you know just little things that irritate you all these little outbursts are creating this phenomenon and his college professor friend which I use that term loosely because he doesn't like anybody tries to tell him exactly what is happening and he doesn't want to hear it I just want to read this one little passage to you and let you see what I'm talking about this is the professor friend talking where do you think that temper of yours goes do you think it disappears no it doesn't it goes into your rooms and into your furniture and into the air. It goes into Sally. It makes everything sick, including you. So basically, Chris's temper and anger and lashing out in this house is creating this phenomena where things are starting to maybe come after him. They're tired of taking his abuse. So this was a really different story. And yeah, you better be careful what you put out into the world. What if you could communicate using your mind only, without speaking or writing? That's the basis for this 1962 story called Mute, which is about a young boy named Paul Nielsen who never talks. After a tragic house fire kills his parents, Paul is found in the woods by the local sheriff and is soon taken in by him and his wife, Cora. Now, Cora quickly becomes attached to Paul and tries to get him to talk, but he is just not having it. He will not speak at all. And so they come to the conclusion that his parents never taught him to speak. He's never been in school. So the sheriff decides, you know, he's going to try to find some relatives of Paul's that can take him in well he writes letters to i forget where he finds the addresses and the names of these people but he sends them out to four different countries i think one's in germany one's in sweden some other places but cora has become attached to him and she burns those letters because she wants to basically take care of him because they lost their own child david i think it was several years ago so he takes over David's room and every day she tries to get him to speak, but she soon realizes that she can kind of pick up what he's thinking. The sheriff decides that he needs to be in school. So they enroll him in school with this teacher named Miss Frank, who is very disciplinary and very forcefully tries to get Paul to even say his own name every day. So one day this man comes looking for Paul because he's not heard from the family in months and it's the first time he's been able to leave the country or 
the city or whatever to go find out what happened to them. And once he finds the sheriff and Cora, it's discovered that Paul's in school, which horrifies the man. He doesn't want Paul to speak because words are harsh and can kill this psychic ability. Nineteen fifty three's Dying Room Only is about a young married couple named Bob and Jean. They are traveling through the desert. They're tired, they're hot, they're hungry. It's been hours since they've had a break or eaten anything, so they decide to pull over and stop at this little cafe they come across on the highway. There are only three men in the establishment, one being the cook, who treats them very rudely. And I think once they start to order one of the men leave, well, Jean decides after they place their order with this asshole cook that she's going to go to the bathroom. A minute or so later, Bob decides to do the same. So when Jean returns, Bob is assumedly still in the bathroom. And so she's sitting there and she waits and she finally gets her food. And she asks one of the men that recently came out of the bathroom if her husband was in there. And he's like, no ma'am, I'm sorry is empty. So she's like, well, that's odd. So she starts to assume that something is wrong. So she asks the men to go in and check on him. And so eventually, reluctantly, the cook opens the door and shows her that no one is in there. So she starts to panic. She goes around the establishment looking everywhere for Bob. The car's still there. It's empty. The bathroom's empty. There is no sign of Bob anywhere. So she calls the police, gets a hold of the sheriff. The cook won't tell her the name of the establishment, but the other guy does. And so the sheriff arrives, he searches the whole place, can't find any signs of Bob. There is a door that's in the bathroom that leads out to the shed, but you can't open that door from the inside. You can only open it from the outside. And so the sheriff requests that the cook go around, unlock the door. So. Sheriff goes down in there, it's dark, it's dirty, but he knows that the cook is lying. And this other guy, he tells him not to go anywhere, but he takes off. So we don't know if there is foul play involved or if something supernatural is going on. And it is not until close to the end that we discover which is which. And I'm not going to tell you which one it was. Nineteen eighty nine's Person to Person is about a man named David Millman who awakens in the middle of the night to his telephone ringing. But once he answers it, he hears the dial tone but can still hear the telephone ringing. And it starts to drive him insane. So he goes to a therapist and he's trying to convince him that it's his subconscious that's trying to reach out to him. And he simply says, try answering it in your mind. And that's what he does the next night. Once the phone starts to ring, he answers it and a voice says, it's about time. At first, the man says Millman is part of a secret government project where a microscopic phone has been implanted inside his brain in order to relay messages from secret government agents. After more therapy sessions, Millman confronts the man saying he doesn't believe his story. And so the guy changes his story. He says he's an inventor who has created this machine that radiates short wave energy that penetrates the mind, enabling two way conversations with them like psychically. But once Millman calls bullshit, the man's voice becomes recognizable as Millman's dead father who was always abusive to him. Dr. Palmer tries everything he possibly can to get Millman to believe that it is only his subconscious and he is in total control of the situation and tells him simply to just hang up on this guy next time he calls. And so once he tries to do that, the guy on the other line mocks him and says, it is too late. You'll never be able to hang up now, David. If a stranger offered you a substantial amount of money to simply press a button, would you? Oh wait, there's a catch. Someone in the world you don't know will die. Would you do it? 1970's Button Button is about a married couple named Norma and Arthur Lewis 
who were faced with just such a dilemma by a mysterious man named Mr. Stewart. Arthur thinks it's a joke and sends Stewart on his way. Norma, however, is very intrigued and becomes money hungry, but Arthur says it's immoral. Still, she can't help but think of all they could do with 50 grand, you know. What would you do with $50,000 just by pressing a button? She phones Mr. Stewart to get more clarification, and the next day the box reappears by their doorstep. Norma hides it in a kitchen cupboard and eventually presses that button, only to discover that she might not know those closest to her after all. Nineteen Sixty Nine's Prey is a story about a 33-year-old woman named Amelia who is torn between spending the evening with her new beau, Arthur. After all, it is his birthday and she just bought him this unique little present or her controlling mother. At first, she cancels her plans with her mother. It's Friday night. They usually do a Friday night thing together, but feels guilty afterwards and cancels her date with Arthur. So, Arthur is a high school teacher, and she bought him a seven-inch wooden doll that's called He Who Kills. He is a deadly hunter and holds an eight-inch spear. And there's also this fine gold chain that's wrapped around its body, and it's said to contain the evil spirit within it. But somehow or another, this doll falls off of the end table, and the chain loosens and it drops off of the doll and when she returns from the bathroom she soon discovers that her life is in danger. She tries everything she can to escape from this little wooden creature, this little wooden doll. She even throws it in the oven but will that be enough to destroy this evil? If your significant other had the power to dream the deaths of real people, local people, would you help them nurture that gift in order to save those people's lives? Or would you withhold that information from these families in order to capitalize on their misfortune? That is the basis for the 1963 story, Girl of My Dreams. It is about a guy named Greg who hates his girlfriend, Carrie, who has this amazing gift that's making them a good amount of money. But after dreaming of the death of a young child whose family is wealthy, all he needs is one last payday before dumping her and fulfilling all of his dreams. They go to the Wheeler's mansion and Greg can hardly contain himself. If only Carrie weren't such a nag and a goody-goody. She doesn't want him asking for a lot of money. She doesn't think it's right, but Greg is very controlling and Carrie is very submissive. So basically, Greg tells Mrs. Wheeler that they will give her the information of how and when her son is going to die if he pays them, I forget if it's like 50 grand, 20 grand, something like that. And then they leave. They go back to the hotel and Greg is just waiting for the opportunity to call Mrs. Wheeler or for her to call him. However, Carrie soon goes and says she needs to lie down in the other room, so she closes the door. Moments later, Greg hears her voice on the phone. He's completely outraged and beats her to death with the phone, but before she dies, she tells him that she knows when he's going to die, and it's very soon. Nineteen Sixties From Shadowed Places is a story about some black magic. Dr. Jennings rushes to his daughter's fiance's New York City Manhattan apartment after a frantic call. Once he arrives, the place is ransacked and he finds Patricia cradling her naked fiance, Peter, laying on the floor. She says that he tried to jump through the window to commit suicide. He's in terrible pain. It hurts to move, it hurts to have clothing on, his head feels like it's going to explode, it feels like ants are crawling all inside of him, and he just cannot take it anymore. The doctor is able to give him an injection of something that eases the pain and brings him back to normalcy, at least temporarily. 
He's then able to tell Dr. Jennings exactly what happened while he was on safari. He pissed off this local witch doctor who has placed the hex on him. Dr. Jennings doesn't really believe that at first, but Patricia believes it, and she calls her old friend Dr. Howe, a woman with experience in such matters, who comes over to perform a ritual to exercise the bad juju from Peter. But will it be too late? In 1961's classic Nightmare at 20,000 Feet is about a guy named Arthur Jeffrey Wilson who is a bad flyer but needs to take a DC-7 to California for business. He's fidgety, nervous, and unable to sleep. During the flight, which takes place at night, he peers out the window and sees something hanging onto the wing of the plane. At first he thinks it's like a dog or a cat or some kind of animal, but soon discovers that it has a human shape with lots of hair all over it. He tries to tell the stewardess that something is out on the plane, but every time he tries to get someone's attention to notice this thing on the wing, the creature flies off like it's nothing. When it returns, it starts picking at the, the propellers and playing with the engine and the paneling around the engine. No one's gonna believe him, but it's a good thing that Arthur brought a gun. absolute favorite Richard Matheson story is another one of his most popular that is 1971's Duel. This is about a guy named Mann who is driving to San Francisco on business and takes the scenic route instead of the interstate where he unwittingly begins this cat and mouse game with a deranged semi-truck driver. So he's just minding his own business driving down the highway and he tries to go around this big semi-truck. You know, no harm, no foul. There are no other cars around, and so he does. But eventually, the semi-truck does the same. He goes around Arthur and then begins stomping on his brakes and swerving into the other lane when Arthur tries to pass him again. And it becomes this whole thing where it builds and builds until man realizes that he is in trouble and he needs to get off the road quickly. He's not one that drives fast, but he guns it to like 70, 80 miles per hour. And he eventually comes across this little cafe where he pulls in really quick and allows the truck to drive on past. So he goes inside, he goes to the bathroom to splash some water on his face, take a breath, but when he comes out, he sees that truck sitting in the parking lot empty. And he knows that trucker is one of these people inside the restaurant, but he didn't pay attention to any of those people when he first came in. But when he goes to leave, after taking a little break at a table, trying to decide who this man is, of course, as soon as he gets in his car, the guy comes out, he can't tell who he is, gets in his truck, and the game begins again. This was very fast paced, high tension. It all comes to a fiery conclusion. I really love this story and it is my top favorite Richard Matheson story and I highly recommend you read it. So what is your favorite Matheson story? Which one of these have you read? I really wish there was a collection that had all 10 of these stories in it. I would definitely want to have that. Maybe there is one. I know there are several different short story collections by Matheson. Unfortunately, unless you see it out in the wild, they don't give you a list of the stories that are in them. So if you know of one, definitely let me know. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next one.